right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our August Buckeye Wellness Lunch and Learn on strength and why you need it. Um, before we get to our wonderful presentation, I want to highlight just a couple of upcoming events we have going on. Our next Lunch and Learn will be September 24th. It will be on Zoom and it'll be also be at noon. It'll be focusing on healthy aging. So we hope to see you there. On September 27th, we have the annual state of health and wellness from two to three. This will be on Zoom. This is a great place to come. Um, we sell Fifteenth, we have Amazing Race coming back. Um, it'll be on the South Oval. Hopefully, we can all get out, enjoy some great fall weather, enjoy being in person again, and have some fun. So, you should get your teams of four registered for that. Um, we have Movement and Mindfulness Mondays. They are every Monday at eleven fifty. They are a great ten minute break in your day to pop on and enjoy some some wellness for you, whether it's mindfulness, or you're going to do some stretches and exercises. It's just a really nice break kind of right there in your, before your lunch hour. And lastly, we have fitness classes continuing. They are all still virtual at the moment, but it'd be great to see all of you guys out at one of our great different classes with our wonderful instructors. Now, during our presentation today, you can post any questions that you have in the chat box and we'll get to them at the end after the presentation. Our wonderful speaker today is Andrew Ebersol. He has worked as a physical therapist assistant since 2012 and has been at Ohio State since 2014. He has previously worked in home health, skilled nursing, and at Riverside Methodist Hospital. Andrew has been involved in strength training and martial arts for over 20 years and used to teach Ikaido at the RPAC. When he's not working, he has a wife and two girls that keep him busy. So Andrew, I will pass it over to you. Yeah, there, hi. So yeah, welcome. Um, I appreciate y'all tuning in. And um, I also work with the exercise and medicine on campus group here. And um, I was talking to Josh and I was like, hey, you know, I'd like to give a presentation. Um, so the opportunity came up and um, I thought I'd talk about strength and why you need it. Um, so, um, Nicole introduced me there. So yeah, I've, um, I worked in healthcare for about 10 or 11 years now. Um, and then, so some of the things I've seen working in like nursing homes and the hospital, you know, it's, it's pretty shocking if you don't get a chance to kind of go behind that curtain, we've all maybe visited somebody in a nursing home or we've, um, been in a hospital, but you know, when you get to see some of the nitty gritty stuff, it's, again, it, it, it's kind of shocking. So. Some of the things I want to talk about today is just why it's so important to stay strong throughout our life and um, how to mitigate some of the you know, rough things that can happen to us as we get older and, and improve everything else we do in our lives. Okay, so just being stronger is just going to make everything else easier. Um, what I'll do here is I'm going to share my screen just to go over to the... Um, so. Got the drop down window here. Let me get out of the way. Excuse me, folks. Okay, there we go. And then, um, so topics, right? Your joints. Your joints are the bottleneck in your physiology, and being strong protects them. Um, we'll talk about what I call the metabolic skeleton key um, falling and how to be friends with the floor. Um, and then the last thing we'll talk about here is proper resistance training is the most effective means of promoting health in all the body's systems. Okay, so let's start here. Um, strength defined. It's the ability to produce force against an external resistance. Your muscles are organs. Okay, they influence metabolic health, cognitive health, and immune system. Okay, so one of the biggest things to talk about here is if you cannot dispose of blood glucose, and glycogen is the storage form of blood glucose, um, metabolic disease onsets. Okay, so um, let's see here, all of your visceral organs, 
you know, they're really like they're just this factory inside of our body to serve the muscle and the brain so we can go out and move around and get food and do the things that life has for us. Um, we need to reframe resistance-based training as the, the main course versus everything else being dessert when it comes to exercise. So we'll talk some about that stuff too. Um, let's see here. Now your skeletal muscle is more than just what I jokingly call meat motors that kind of animate our bodies and allow us to move throughout the world. They are organs, right? They're part of our organ system. And that has a huge amount of influence over your metabolic health, your cognitive health, and your immune system. Now, um, so, you know, I, it, I think I'll, what's very important is to move away from the notion that strength training as something that only athletes do or some hollow and vain endeavor, you know, but rather it's the most impactful thing that you can do to improve your health in every way. Um, you know, I get it. You know, it's images of like drug filled bodybuilders or fitness models on magazines or sweaty people grunting in the gym and dropping heavy weights. And, you know, that it's kind of polarizing. Either you're kind of into some of that stuff or you're not. But um, a lot of that stuff is also, also kind of unhealthy, especially when it comes to the, the bodybuilding type stuff or whatever. But, you know, one thing about strength training is, you know, it is hard work. And, but, you know, life is hard. So you've got to choose your heart. Um, there's no magic bullet to curing any disease, but you know when you look at all the literature on whatever health thing you're looking at, right? Health um, and um, you know strength training and sleeping are pretty much as close to a magic bullet as you're ever going to find with anything. Okay, so so yeah, moving often, being strong, and sleeping well it fixes most things. All right, so now this is what I call the metabolic skeleton key. I kind of like to think about how we use energy in our body from that 30,000 foot view, because um, it's really complex. And I don't want to get into the weeds with biochemistry and all that type of stuff, but there's kind of an interesting way that I view it. And maybe you might too. Okay, so you know, we know that metabolically, we're pretty broken um, as a country, uh, developed nations, US, England, and even lots of Asia, it's getting really, really bad with diabetes. Uh, you know, uh, it's about 36% of US adults are obese and that's BMI over 30. Don't always like the BMI thing, but when we're just talking about average everyday people. It, it has some, some value there. Now, I think what's, what's happened is us humans, we're very clever. We're very, very clever. And we figured out a way of creating an energy rich environment that requires very little physical activity to go about our lives. And well, this has been a disaster, right? Food is everywhere and yeah, not, not a lot of physical activity or hardship required anymore. So managing the energy we're consuming is upsetting. It's, it's an issue. Um, and in fact, if you want to destroy an organism's health, just overfeed it and under mobilize it. It's a catastrophe. So a little bit with energy breakdown, you know, if, um, if anybody knows a lot about this stuff, I mean, I'm just kind of telling you things you already know, but I'm just trying to get some people to buy in who don't go into the weeds with some of this stuff. Um, I want you to think about your muscle is like these battery packs all over your body, right? So the, the, the meat motors, if you will, that move us around, they've also got their onboard energy tanks. And you store about 200 grams of glycogen which is the storage form of glucose in your, um, in your muscles, right? And about 70 in the liver. That's really reserved, like when you're sleeping or something like that. So, you know, as far as adipose tissue goes or fat, let's not even go there. I don't really care right now. But for that more immediate energy that we need, um, glycogen in the muscles needs to be cycled in and out. And this is the really, really key point I want everybody to understand these battery packs that are all over our bodies, if they're always topped off, they're always filled up, the system starts to behave erratically, starts to break down. We have things like insulin resistance starts, um, diabetes, then cholesterol, heart disease, it's a downward spiral. So disposing of glucose in the blood is of the utmost importance. And, um, and too much blood glucose in your body for too long destroys the body from the inside out. This later results in all types of, well, horrible issues, you know, heart disease, neurodegenerative diseases, amputations, 
it gets really, really bad. And I want everybody to see that, you know, what I see in the hospital, what I see in the nursing home, um, you know, it's, it, it, it should scare you. And I think a lot of times if people knew how bad it gets and how scary it gets, maybe they would make different decisions along the way. But here's what's cool. This is, this is where the cool part comes in. So with the whole insulin resistance thing, right? So the blood sugar can't get shuttled into the cell because the cells are full and they're not receptive and they don't want to let the insulin do its job. Okay, right? There's no room in the end, right? But skeletal muscle has a special ability to dispose of that blood sugar. And, um, but you got it, you got to use intensity. You have to be able to actually use the muscle. There has to be a reason for this mechanism to happen, right? So high intensity style training taps into this machinery that's built into us. And the big thing is if you're not cycling out that blood glycogen, it gets stale in there, it gets built up, then it does not activate the system, right? So our bodies work on an on-demand system. There's only, there's no reason to do something if there's no need. Now, this is also the reason too why what they call LSD or long, slow distance cardio, we're not contracting your muscles hard enough with too light of weights well, it kind of yields a poor result. I mean, you, you, people get stuck. They're not really making any changes. They can't get their blood uh, profiles to turn around. They can't get that body composition to turn around. And, you know, um, this is really frustrating for a lot of people. And, you know, sadly to say, maybe you were sold a bill, a bill of goods, but if you're not moving your muscles intensely enough or contracting them hard enough, you're just not going to have that machinery kick off. So there is something you can kind of look at where, the cross-sectional area of your leg, the, the thigh area, right? And when, when, when we scan people like an MRI and we, we look at that cross-sectional area of the, of the leg, we see the, uh, the femur, the bone is in the middle. You got all the muscle in around that. And then how much fat on the outside of the muscle, this is kind of an indicator of where you are on that metabolic disease spectrum. Um, so especially in the legs, it's especially in the legs that we got to have that muscle be built and maintained over our lifetime to dispose of that glucose, right? Your, your legs are really good at that. They're very hungry when you use them. Um, and this is why your joints are the bottleneck in your physiology, right? Because if you have joint pain, my hip hurts, my knee hurts, my ankles hurt, my back hurts, you're not gonna wanna move. And so there's this vicious cycle that starts on, right? So you don't wanna move, it hurts. You can't get in to see anybody. You're not getting any relief from your doc or whoever. Um, you're not going to want to exercise. So that's why this one of the key concepts I want to say is, you know, your joints are the bottleneck in your physiology. And the stronger you keep them, the more you move them, the more that you're going to be able to move. Okay. Um, let's see here. Let's talk about um, another big problem that's facing us, especially here in the U.S., developed nations around the world, but um, falling. And falling is really, really bad, okay? I, I need everybody to understand how bad falling is. And you might be saying to yourself, hey, I'm young. What does it matter? Well, it will. Um, maybe one of us knows somebody who's fallen, um, fallen and broken a hip. Uh, so falling is a major problem that's developed or facing developed nations. And as we have engineered the physical challenge out of living our lives, we stop sitting on the floor and we sit in chairs all day long, the rates of falling have only increased. Now, um, so, so the, the statistics of falling are staggering. And that's my one pun for the day, not to make light of it. But uh, working in the hospital on the trauma floor and skilled nursing, most of those patients that I'll see who come in, especially on, on the trauma floor, they've fallen and they've broken that hip and it's miserable, okay? This is really, really bad. This is where your life changes for the worst. Um, one of my grandmothers fell, broke a hip, went to the nursing home, never came out. My, uh, my, my grandmother-in-law fell, broke her hip, went to the nursing home, came home for maybe just about a month, had to go back, died. Um, this is definitely where people's lives change for the worst. And, and the key point here is if you are not strong enough to overcome the surgery and the rehabilitation process, you will be in long-term care and die not long after. I mean, it really, really is scary. Um, 
So again, most of us probably know somebody who's fallen and it's really, really tragic. And it's really rough working with those people because just even getting out of bed then for them to try to get them up to rehab, it's, yeah, it, it doesn't work very well for them. Um, so most falls are preventable. And especially if we stay strong enough and if we're getting up and down from the ground more often, um, I think just what happens as we get older or you know whatever, um, sitting in chairs, we stop getting on the ground as kids. And um, so it, you know this kind of downward slide starts to happen. Um, if you think about it now, as, as a baby, you had to do a lot of uh, strength training to get up off the floor. And so um, that first year or so of your life, that, that was a lot of time on the floor. And yeah, you fell down a lot, but the difference then was you were soft and squishy and you were built to take that. Um, as we get older, not so much. Bones break really easily, especially when you're not strong or you haven't kept your bones strong. So um, let's see here. I want you to think about um, this. So we've got this graph um, kind of shows how on that Y axis there, so muscle strength and muscle mass and then uh, X axis there, age. So you see that you know earlier in life, the more that you're able to build and maintain your muscle mass, the more that's gonna pay off in the long run. You know, similar to investing in retirement, building or maintaining muscle mass earlier in life determines the quality and amount that you're gonna retain later in life. So um, you can kind of see that, you know, hey, none of us are gonna to live to be 150 years old, or at least I don't want to. I just don't wanna have my, my quality of life be so poor. Um, and lifespan versus, versus health span, these different phrases we use. You know, we wanna think about quality over quantity. Now, let's see here. So if you're not invested in your physical future, well, you better invest in long-term care or be prepared to leave your home early. I want people to think about it kind of like as they're investing in their 401k. So invest in your physical 401k. Um, again, whenever I'm working in the hospital, you can tell the people who are gonna do well. Okay, they're, they're generally stronger, they're moving around a lot, they can get up and down from the ground easily. So I've got um, a study here that, uh, or a video and then a study that it comes from. This, out of Brazil, there was this physician named Claudio Gil Araujo, and he shows how important it is to be able to rise from a seated position on the floor and how that relates to mortality. And they have this test called the sit and rising test. Now this test is scored out of 10. You start with a 10, you're sitting on the floor. And I'm gonna show a video so it kind of explains this. And um, so your, your doctor point for every point of contact you got to use from your arms so yeah so falling it's really really bad now that that's kind of uh, I mean that's a bit of a challenge it's kind of fun for you to check out I'm not really as strict as that if I'm working with somebody who's older or um, I think there's there's better ways of getting up and down from the ground I think the biggest thing is is not having to use your arms right so you can do different ways of getting up and down from the ground and then, um, you know, so that, that's kind of strict, but you know, here is the, the data that came out of that, right? So this, this, this physician who came up with this called the sit to rise test, right? Over 2000 patients between ages of 51 and 80. Now he and his colleagues found that individuals who scored fewer than eight points on the test were twice as likely to die within the next six years compared to those who scored higher nine and 10, right? So basically perfect scores. Those who scored three or fewer points were more than five times as likely to die within the same time period compared to those who scored more than eight points. Overall, each point increase in the sit to rise test was associated with 21% decrease in mortality from all causes. So not just, you know, how, you know, whatever uh, flexible your ankles are or whatever, but just all causes. So it, it's, it's an interesting indicator. Other, other ones are like your grip strength, how strong your grip is, stuff like that. But I think the biggest thing I wanna communicate here with strength and falling is we must be friendly with the floor, okay? You have to be, be friends with the floor every day. If we don't get on the floor at least once, you know, this is, um, this is something that we can do to limit 
our risk of falling often later in life. And Lord knows you don't want to break a hip. You don't want to break a hip and go to the hospital. It's horrible. It's horrible. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but ground-based exercise programs, they are a lot of fun. They're kind of primitive. You get to kind of go back to baby stage and see where your strength is. And um, they allow you to work on strength without lifting weights if you're not into lifting weights as much. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, Okay, so not all exercise is the same, right? I, I love movement. I love exercise. Any reason for people to get out and get moving, bike riding, running, bocce ball, rock climbing, I don't care what it is. It is good. It's all good. We, just, we do have to kind of focus, though, on priorities, okay? So exercise can either break you down or it can build you up. Hey, Andrew? Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Could you, it might just be on my end, but could you try resharing your screen again? It's not popping up for me uh, okay excuse me here um, excuse me folks thank you for reminding me <laughs> there we go sorry yeah. to interrupt yeah sorry about that okay so uh, not all exercise is the same Okay, so in the world of physical activity for health, you can either be in an anabolic state or a catabolic state. Um, certain exercises lend themselves more to building you up versus breaking you down. In relation to the notion of exercise as medicine, right? That's kind of why I got involved with the exercise as medicine group is um, this is where resistance-based training is the star of the show. Uh, you know, only resistance-based training if done properly, and I'm gonna use that caveat, is an anabolic endeavor, mostly due to its growth hormone signaling, right? So growth hormone, oh, the fountain of youth, you secrete it out of your pituitary gland. And um, you have to trigger, much like with the, the uh, muscle glycogen thing, you have to trigger that growth hormone to be released, okay? So all other forms are gonna be suboptimal, but not to be overlooked, right? So. It should be more considered fun endeavors or variety or social things. And I love to do other things just other than strength training too, but priorities are priorities, okay? So for reference, now in the world of physical therapy, we only use resistance-based modalities to restore function and help relieve pain. Certainly I love stretching and mobility, um, but we don't put people on treadmills to get them stronger to recover from an injury or from pain. Um, we don't put people on exercise bikes or make them go out and run. It, it, it's pretty much strength, right? Same as when you're a baby, you gotta get your range of motion, you gotta get your strength through that range of motion to protect your joints, to move well. Now, one of my cert certifications is in a program called the Delay the Disease Program. This is a program designed to help mitigate the progression or even reverse the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's is horrible. And anybody you know who has it, it's really, really rough for them, okay? So this is where lifting weights and being strong helps to protect your brain. Um, the basic theory with the dyslated disease program is that when you perform gross motor patterns, so big arms and legs and body all moving at the same time motor patterns, and, and, and physically exert yourself, the brain secretes a chemical that causes it to heal and new connections to grow. So it's a very powerful program and it works with um, not only Parkinson's disease, but other neurodegenerative diseases. We see a lot of improvement with people that are already afflicted with one of these neurodegenerative diseases and they get back to moving and exercising, but especially with doing strength and resistance. And um, it's shown great success in improving cognitive decline or even with reversing some of those symptoms. And this is, um, Let's see here. So see again, there is something magical about contracting your muscles intensely that keeps our brain and our bodies young. Now, many people feel that, oh, strength training is dangerous and I'm gonna get hurt if I do that. And they'll, um, but that's just not really the case. It, it turns out if you wanna go by statistics and there's lots of statistics out there, I haven't included a lot of stats with this presentation because you can do your own research. But the one stat I found was, you know, only about 2 to 0.4 to 3.3 injuries per 1,000 hours of exposure are with lifting weights. And that's just lifting weights. Not, not, that's not necessarily just doing ground-based things. 
right? And this is far less than if we're going to talk about doing basketball, soccer, biking, ultimate frisbee, um, rock climbing, tennis, and even even running, right? You know, running's a lot of fun, minimal equipment, but it's it's going to wear you down. So, so I just I, I want people to not be so turned off by resistance based training and strength training because it has a lot to do with keeping your bodies young. Um, with such little time in our lives, you know, we got to pick exercise modalities that are going to facilitate health and not rob us of it, no matter how fun they may be. And those, all those other activities that we do, well, they're going to be made better by the stronger you are. Strength always goes in the forward direction. Now, I like to um, say, if you say to yourself, well, hey, I like to run. Okay, that's great. Just be sure you have a strength training program to facilitate that. And there's other reasons like mental health, social events, sport specific. So yeah, just um, we can't overlook and we must prioritize strength as the center of any exercise program or practice. Now, let's see here. Um, build your legs, your core and your grip to stay young. That's kind of what it comes down to. I mean, I really don't care what you look like in the mirror. I'm not into isolation exercises, like making certain muscles look bigger. Who, who really cares? If it cares to you, fine. But if you're looking at it from a very scientific, a very medical way of looking at things, your legs, your core, and your grip, you know, the stronger all three of those are, you're going to stay pretty young. You're going to signal to your body, hey, you know, we, we need to stay young. And that comes in the form of hormone signaling, right? So growth hormone, all the other hormones that need to be proper. Bone density is so going to keep your bones very strong or dense to help hold you up. That BDNF secretion in the brain. So BDNF, right? Brain-derived neurotropic factor. It's that, uh, it's that miracle growth that our brain secretes when we exercise, we move our bodies and exert them. Another thing I didn't get into, but you can look a lot into this, is also with um, with our immune system, and um, just again how how healthy our muscle system is, the better the immune system is going to be. Okay. So I hate where to start. Where to start? Okay. So simple things: ten minute walks. Walking is awesome and overlooked. Walking is great. Use your legs now, especially after meals. Um, one study I was reading, uh, metformin, the drug that helps to lower blood sugars, we're seeing better performance out of just a 10 minute walk after you eat a meal than metformin. So, hey, less drugs, yay, right? Yeah, right. Uh, hiking outdoors, so again, using the legs, uh, hiking, changing levels, going up and down inclines, your legs get an amazing amount of stimulus for strength and hiking legs are very special legs. They're gonna carry you through life very well. Taking stairs, that goes into the hiking legs thing. So the taking stairs thing, I try to take stairs whenever I can. If it's over three floors, okay, take the elevator, I get it. <laughs> um, but yeah, if it's a flight, if it's two flights, you know, hey, if, if it's three flights and you feel like, you know, hey, let's, let's give it a shot, you get a little out of breath at the top, that's when that BDNF, that miracle grow, secre uh, secretes out of our brain, helps to build our brain, and then, um, Again, it's all about those signals to keep your body young. Uh, getting on the floor every day, getting on the floor. So getting your palms of your hands on the floor, getting your feet and your hands both on the floor, getting on your back, getting on your back and rolling, coming back up to a seated position and stand. I showed you the video on the sit to stand test. So um, again, that sit to stand test is kind of a fun challenge. I don't think you have to do it just like that. There's other ways, and I'll describe that here in a little bit. Um, a standing desk versus a sitting desk. Okay, now I have patients with back pain and they say, oh, you know, if, if I stand too long, I have back pain too. Yeah, any one position held for too long, yeah, it's, it's, it's gonna cause pain. Um, but we wanna be able to have a sitting and standing and alternating back and forth, even going down to take a knee. So kneeling at your desk, go back to sitting, options. Uh, yoga 101. Okay, so lots of crazy yoga, lots of pretzel, bendy bodies, a little intimidating. Did the basics of yoga, they've been around for thousands of years for a reason. Okay, so we have to 
um, you know, just basic like stuff on YouTube, yoga videos, get on the floor, be friendly with the floor, yoga 101. And I guess, you know, a, one of the biggest things I'm always trying to communicate to my patients is, you know, ultimately we need to move beyond the notion of strength training as some, something that only athletes or gym bros do, or, um, you know, rather it's the most potent dose of physical medicine we can spend our time on. And it's going to make everything else you enjoy doing better. It's going to help you more be more resilient to injuries. So you don't have to come see me at the student health center and help you with your back pain or your knee pain or your hip pain. Um, and at the end of your life, at the end of your life, you know, it's not how fast your mile time is. Okay. It is nearly, it's, um, it's so much more important to have lean muscle mass and have cultivated that muscle over the years of your life. And, um, you know, what matters, like if I'm working with somebody in a hospital or a nursing home, can you get up and down from a toilet without using your arms? Can you get up and down from a toilet without having me help you? And something I have to do quite often is I'll have to wipe somebody. I have to help them get cleaned up on the toilet. And, you know, that, that's, that's pretty rough for them. They feel kind of embarrassed. And, you know, hey, I, I do it because it's part of what I do. But, you know, we just have to be thinking about this stuff. So your legs, especially, and how strong your legs are. Can you squat down? Can you squat up? Getting up in and out of a chair without using your arms, very, very important. These are the things that matter at the end of your life. And then, um, so I'll talk a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about the basics of program design, right? So like, where do I start? Well, I gave you some ideas of some basic things, but if you're talking about resistance training, right? So what's gonna keep your body young? It's what I call the patterns of life, okay? So as I said, I don't care about how you look in the mirror isolation. I don't really care about isolating muscles and making certain muscles look good. Who cares about that? So there's, there's patterns. Our, our brain doesn't know muscles. It knows patterns. And there's um, these five here laid out. I'm taking this from, from Dan John, who uh, I'll, I'll link later here, but so squatting, right? So squatting down, heels down, or even if your heels come up, can you squat all the way down? Um, something I talk about, and it's kind of like, people don't want to always think about this, but you know, sitting in chairs and sitting on toilets have, have robbed us of that, that deep heels to the ground squatting position. And if all of human history up until now with, um, with toileting, especially, you know, we were squatting all the way down. And again, I'll just throw it out there. Being able to squat down is very, very important. It's kind of a biomarker for yourself. Um, that's what's called the goblet squat, where you hold a weight in front, like you're drinking from a goblet or a front squat, or you can use a barbell or just body weight. Uh, hinging, hinging is folding forward at the hips so that you have your, your deadlift, your single leg, Romanian deadlift, your kettlebell swing. Um, you watch golfers uh, bend over and that back leg comes up. That's a hinging pattern. The spine is fixed, but the hip is moving and the knees don't really move that much. So it's a little bit bent. Um, with the arms, you got pushing and pulling. Okay, you want to look at all the different elbow bendy pushing stuff. It really comes down to pushing and pulling horizontal and vertical. And this can be either with machines, with barbell, body weight, TRX. You know, there's again, I'm not going to get into a lot of the minutiae with different things that are out there because you can do some of your own research, but this is just, it's about the patterns, right? Because your brain does not know individual muscles. And with enough resistance in these patterns, that's what's going to trigger those metabolic things I talk about, um, that BDNF, the miracle growth for the brain secretion and all your hormones to optimize. Um, another one, the fifth one here that carry, right? So carrying weights. So holding weights and walking, a sandbag, a rucksack, a heavy backpack, right? So there is something magical too about just carrying weights. Now, over off to the side, you know, okay, the real money and strength is the programming, right? And it's almost the underside of the iceberg where just knowing the movements themselves, that really is maybe five or 10%. But if you're gonna start somewhere, you can do three sets, three times 10, so three sets of 10 reps. And then, you know, how do you know what the resistance is, right? Okay, so if it's on a machine or if you're using a weight, repetitions eight, nine, and 10 should be challenging. And it's, if you're going to carry something, you know, about 30 yards, if you're going to carry a heavier object or just, again, load up a backpack, 
or a sandbag or something like that. And you, you can do caring, which is great. Um, but the whole thing with getting hurt and, and, and strength training, and people are so worried about getting hurt, and I understand, but it's like getting a sunburn, right? I don't like getting a sunburn, but I like to be tan. And, you know, we know that the sun is good for us, but it's just not about getting blasted with it. And people that tend to get hurt, lifting weights, doing strength training, they're usually just getting greedy. And um, it's, it's always about adaptation over time. So this is where you're going to have to do a little bit of research for yourself. And I'll, I'll have some resources here that you can look at, but, um, but you have to slowly adapt over time, usually two to three times a week and um, three sets of 10 with those patterns I listed there. That's a good place to start. Um, I guess this is one thing I like. I saw this quote a long time ago. I don't, don't know where it comes from, but I, I like the sentiment, right? So, so choose your heart, okay? Marriage is hard. Divorce is hard. Choose your heart. Obesity is hard. Being fit is hard. Choose your heart. Being in debt is hard. Being financially disciplined is hard. Choose your heart. Communication is hard. Not communicating is hard. Choose your heart. Life will never be easy. It will always be hard. But we can choose our hard. So I ask you to pick wisely. Um, some of the resources here I'll have is uh, Original Strength, right? So Original Strength, they're a great organization. Um, all basic floor-based strength and mobility fun stuff. Go to their YouTube channel. Uh, Tim Anderson, the guy who's the head of Original Strength, he shows a lot of baby crawling, rolling around, moving on the ground, fun stuff. He makes it fun, usually pretty short videos. That's easy ideas there. Uh, GMB Fitness, so a little bit more increased strength training from the floor. Um, it's, you know, it's a little bit more in between moderate level. Some stuff is, is, is hard, but that's up to you. Strong First, so they're the organization that I always point to with kettlebells. So kettlebells are kind of like my first thing that I love using. Um, and then uh, Pavel um, and his organization Strong First has great instruction there. Uh, starting strength. So starting strength is barbell instruction. I, it, in my opinion, it's the best barbell instruction. So the barbell especially is very intimidating. And um, well, if you can put more weight on something, the chance of getting hurt is easier. But the way that they teach it and their principles they use are about the safest version that I've found. So they have lots of great free videos too. And then of course, there's a good book and other resources there. Um, Another gentleman that I love, and he, he's kind of like a mentor from afar, his name is Dan John, and he has a website called Dan John University, so it's all around strength and conditioning, um, strength and conditioning for life, the, the extreme sport of living and life. All right, folks, so that's what I had to present there. Um, Nicole, I'll, I'll take any questions anybody has. I know I kind of painted with a broad brush over a lot of topics there. And I didn't go into a lot of minutia, but, you know, 30 some minute presentation, right? So. Yeah, that was, that was great, Andrew. So uh, lots of great tips for us and information for us to take for ourselves, for our loved ones. So thank you for doing that. Um, before we get to the questions, I just want to make a comment to all the attendees. You'll be receiving a post email after this. It'll have a link to an evaluation if you could take just a couple minutes and to fill it out it really helps us better our programming we'll have a link to the slides today as well so be on the lookout for that it'll come either later today or monday morning we had a lot of great comments and questions coming through in the chat i know we had some people commenting on they've started yoga and are loving it we had someone who was walking on a treadmill right now so just great stuff in there so our, the first question that came through was asking um, any tips on how to fall correctly? Yeah, yeah. So like my background in martial arts, that was kind of the main thing. Everybody asked me how to fall properly first. And I'm not going to get too demonstrative, demonstrative on the camera because, you know, angles and all that. But the easiest thing to start from is from your knees. So if you're sitting on your couch, slide down onto your knees so you're in tall kneeling and maybe i will indulge you guys a little bit here um, so if you're on your knees you put your hands up like hands up and from here you can start to lower yourself to the ground 
And again, I'm going out of the camera, but you get the point. So this is what I call your landing gear, okay? So from your elbow to your hands, all in one straight line, and we wanna absorb all of our stress through the arms here first. So we, we don't wanna jam our wrists in this bent position, okay, bad news. And then just slowly over time from your knees, you can fall forward, you can get a couch cushion in front of you. And then just get used to the notion of losing your balance and falling forward. Falling backwards is a little bit more tricky, but it's kind of the same story. If you're sitting on the floor, you put your arms out, put your arms out, and again, this is where couch cushions are nice. You put the couch cushion behind you, and then you can just kind of get used to easily kind of just falling to the floor. So no momentum, and then you know you're you're on the floor already. From there, it gets a little bit trickier, but again, you know, couch cushions and staying low and just building up slowly over time. But but yeah, um, falling and breaking that for some reason about how people fall, they land on that hip, they break that hip. It's very common. Great, thank you. The next question that we had is asking, are there any classes as part of your plan for health um, that provides us with provides us with proper use of free weights and machines in the gym for strength training or anything you know from exercises medicine? Yeah, so that's where you want to contact the Exercises Medicine on campus um, and on their website. I know Josh Wynn, he's the head of that. And we've got, there's an organization here on campus. But, um, you know, I, that's why I originally talked to Josh about like, hey, you know, people are kind of intimidated and they don't know where to start with strength training. So I'm willing to, you know, maybe meet up at the RPAC or do something like that. And so maybe something like that might come in the future, but at least through your healthcare provider and they can link you to the uh, Exercises um, Medicine website. And, um, and they'll have more information about that. Otherwise from there, like over the RPAC, they've got like personal training. And again, one thing about strength training is there is a little bit of knowledge. You have to do a little bit of research, but again, you're investing in yourself, you're investing in your future. I'm gonna actually pop my camera off my Zoom keeps freezing. So we'll see if this helps me on my end. All right, our next question is asking, any tips on muscle and joint pain after lifting weight, lifting weights and strength training other than ibuprofen? Yeah, so if, again, if you gotta take something to sleep or if it's distracting because the pain's really getting up there, yeah, do it, try not to if you can. But in general, that's a sign that something's going on. So most people that come into my clinic here at the Will Student Health Center is, um, you know, they get their evaluations, they, they see their doctor, and a lot of times there's a, there's a joint restriction. So you have tight ankles, you have tight hamstrings or something like that. And if you're moving through these patterns and the weight is low enough and, and the motion's good, you know, you shouldn't be anything but just muscularly sore. And, you know, muscle soreness is not totally well understood, but joint pain, no, I don't want anybody to work through pain. I do believe in tough. I do believe in pain. Yeah, but we're not being uh, stupid. We're not working through joint pain. So probably just have somebody check that out. Usually on the pain scale, that zero to 10 pain scale, up to about a four, and then from dull and achy to sharp and stabby, you start getting over a four, you start getting into that stabby, sharp pain, stop, 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 stop. Dull and achy, you know, assess, maybe give it a couple of times and to see what happens. But otherwise, then you come check us out or contact your physician to go to PT. Are there any specific household chores we can incorporate, such as carrying laundry and taking it outside to get that you know, strength and resistance in there? Yeah, so what I said, you know, if we're looking at the cross-sectional area of your leg and how much of that is muscle versus fat, so we wanna keep our legs strong. So doing the stairs, carrying stuff, but um, your grip, your grip, right? So your, your grip is kind of like, it's this internal barometer of how strong you are and how healthy you are. And older, older people, you know, much, much beyond 65, 70, 80, your grip, it's like a neurological barometer for how um, this overall our body is doing. So if you're lying in the hospital sick with cancer, your grip is not gonna be very strong, right? So anything you can do to, um, to carry things more with your hands, um, maybe carry more groceries at a time. And then, you know, yard work, um, walking, mowing your yard with the, with the lawnmower, stuff like that. 
But uh, yeah, you got to get a little bit, little bit creative there. But yeah, grip and mm -hmm. strength in the grip is so important. Awesome. Our next question is asking, um, what if you have had double knee replacement and can't go on your knees? Yeah, that's going to be really, really tough. That's where things start to get a little bit challenging. And that once you've done enough damage, once you've gone so far down the rabbit hole, it is tough to get back to doing certain things. But um, so that, that's a good one, double knee replacement. You know, in general, they want you to be able to get back to about a 120 degree bend at your knees so you can sit on a low commode. Okay, so, but that's different than bearing weight on your knees. So maybe it's about exposure. There are people that go back to lifting very heavy weights with hip replacements and knee replacements. But, um, you know, it might just be that when you're sitting on your couch, and you scoot one a hip out and you put one knee down on the floor and you just slowly get used to putting one knee on the floor and slowly adding a little bit of body weight. So much of what I wanna communicate with resistance-based training is that you, you adapt over time. And the same thing with something like that. So you can't just go like, just plop yourself on the floor and, and be tall kneeling or where you're, you're up on your knees but start to ease into it and see where it's at. I don't want to go against your orthopedic surgeon's advice, but I will admit that one's tricky and I don't have a great answer there. Let's see, we have three more questions right now that hopefully can get us right to that one o'clock mark. So I know you got to head out right at one. So our next question is, what are some more strength training ideas for people that don't like the gym? Yeah, so the biggest thing is, is I know we saw with COVID, come on, um, people really deconditioned, even a lot of our grad students we were seeing who were here the whole time, you know, people were just sitting more and on, the, on these Zoom meetings and th thankfully we have something like Zoom, but it's really, this isn't what real life should be. So the sitting is rough and you know, right next to your chair you're sitting at is you can do any form of body weight exercise or yoga. So um, one kettlebell, one usually 18 to 20, five pound kettlebell can do a, a lot of amazing exercises. So my first love is doing kettlebells. Um, I bought a 35 pound, which is quite heavy for someone who isn't already pretty strong, but um, they make them in really baby size ones to, to, you know, medium size ones. And there's tons of videos online with learning how to do either a kettlebell swing or the get up. The Turkish get up is one of the greatest exercises to keep your body young and mobile. So you start from the floor and you go to a standing position, lots of videos online, Turkish get up, um, doing a plank hold, doing any basic yoga. But yeah, if you're in your home, you don't feel like going to the gym. A lot of my patients, they only feel comfortable coming into even PT. You got at least do body weight versions of exercises. I talked about the patterns of living, right? So don't get caught in isolation. But yeah, squatting down, um, pushing and pulling with the arms. There's your push up from your knees, push up from your legs. Um, and then there are, you know, bands. You can get resistance bands. Resistance bands are good. The thing about resistance bands is that, you know, just try to go a little bit slower out and slower back in or up and how you're using the resistance so that you get that time under tension. Great advice. And that kind of leads us perfectly into the next question, which is asking, can you comment on the use of free weights versus resistance bands for people 65 and older? Yeah, so I, I love resistance bands. We use them all the time here in physical therapy. And, and in general, they're gonna be safe because they're gonna provide you tension and resistance, right? Tension and resistance that you can slowly move in and out. A free weight, there's a point at which your bones will stack against the weight and it kind of becomes like you're just kind of, you're holding the weight with your bones versus, I'll use the example of like a bicep curl, right? So once the weight gets to the top, then it's just stacked through your bones, but here's where the resistance starts. And with, with resistance bands, they're gonna provide more continuous tension throughout the pattern. Remember, we're thinking about patterns. So I love resistance bands. There's tons of resistance band companies like on Amazon or whatever, and they have handles you can hold on to. Um, you have to find an anchor point. Usually you can oftentimes stand on one end of the band, but yeah, resistance bands are fantastic. And especially like the, those circle bands to go around your knees for like glute exercises or walking. Those are awesome for keep, keeping your hips and your, your legs strong. Great. 
All right, and then the last question that we have right now is um, an attendee had commented they, they've had lower back surgery. So the video showing sitting down and getting back up without using their hands kind of scares them going into the sitting position because they might actually fall. And they aren't sure if this is something that they should even try to do. You have any advice? Yeah, right. So I, I, I use that video as an example from that research study with that sit rising test. Um, yeah, that's a little bit of a parlor trick that, uh, that, that crossing your feet and standing up. So that's what they used, but I'm not really a big fan of it. When you go to that original strength website or, um, the, the website or the, uh, the YouTube channel for original strength, his name's Tim Anderson. He has a lot of great videos. And, um, on some of the videos there, they show you how to get up without doing that kind of cross your feet and kind of, you know, stand up real quick, but uh, yeah just practice getting on all fours. So hands and knees, um, being able to uh, get up and down from the ground, using your hands is perfectly fine. Don't um, be all or nothing about this. And yeah, if you've had back surgery, it kind of hurts to move your back in a certain way. Or you don't want to fall backwards. We're not going to do anything to put yourself in a dangerous position, but just, again, I say, if you're not used to getting on the floor, use your couch or chair, a stable one, you kind of slide down to the knees and then you go to all fours. Then you can go to lay on the floor, either on your belly or on your back, work on rolling and then rolling and coming up to the crawling and hands and knees position again. Sorry, I would demonstrate, but it's kind of tough with the camera angle here. But yeah, please don't be all or nothing about that. And that was just kind of a, it's a bit of a parlor trick almost, it seems that. But um, yeah, very important to uh, just practice getting up and down from the ground, have a loved one come over to help you if you feel intimidated to help get back up. That's great advice. Okay. That was the last question that we had. Uh, I just wanna comment, Karen just posted in the chat box uh, an app that she uses that has some strength training classes and rolling around that kind of relate back to what Angie was saying earlier. And we got some more people posting in some stuff that they've used that align with what you're saying. So this is great. And Andrew, thank you so much for being here with us today, giving us all this wonderful information. It's so useful and we all need it. So thank you. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. And I hope you have a great rest of your Friday, a great weekend. And we will hopefully see you at next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.